This episode was recommended by a listener, Lydia, on Twitter. If you'd like to suggest a topic, you can contact us on Twitter at Morbid Podcast or on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast or on our website at www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. This interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. When I asked several regular people what came to mind when they heard the term headhunter, most of them answered business. Today, the term headhunter means a corporation or individual that seeks talented people with specific skills or experience in an area of business and recruits them, usually taking them from one company to another with offers of better pay. When we morbidly curious folk hear the term headhunter, We tend to think of the more traditional meaning of the term, a person who hunts the heads of other humans. Headhunting is the practice of seeking, removing, and preserving human heads. A short summary of the origin of headhunting is that some cultures hold a belief in the existence of a material soul matter on which all life depends, and in humans, this soul matter is believed to be located in the head. Removing the head is believed to capture that soul matter, and taking it back to one's own home adds to the stock of soul matter belonging to a single person or a community, and that stock contributes to the fertility of the population, livestock, and crops. Headhunting has been associated with other ideas regarding the head as the seat of the soul, such as one form of cannibalism in which the body or part of the body is consumed in order to transfer the soul matter of the victim to the eater. It's possible that headhunting developed from cannibalism, and then, in some cultures, further developed into human sacrifice, a practice that has been generally associated with agricultural societies. Headhunting has been practiced worldwide and may date as far back as the Mesolithic era, or the Middle Stone Age, about 8,000 to 4,000 BCE in Europe. A Mesolithic example of a collection of human heads is from Offnet Cave in southern Germany, where two pits were discovered that were filled with human skulls, one with 28 and the other with six. Some of these skulls still had cervical or neck vertebrae attached, and several of them had cut marks on them, suggesting decapitation with a sharp weapon. The ages of the individuals at death ranged from newborn to elderly, with most being around 20 to 30 years old. All the skulls were buried facing west. It is thought that the skulls were not placed in the pits all at once, but accumulated over many years. It is not known if the individuals were killed for the purpose of removing their heads or died of natural causes. Either way, the burial of severed heads indicates some special importance surrounding the head. Another prehistoric example is the plastered skulls of Jericho and Ayin Ghazal, During the Neolithic, or Late Stone Age, people often buried their dead under the floors of their homes. Sometimes the skull was removed, and its cavities were filled with plaster. Shells were inset for eyes, and paint was used to represent facial features, hair, and even mustaches. Some scholars believe that this burial practice represents an early form of ancestor worship, while others argue that the plastered skulls may be an example of the practice of headhunting, in which they were taken and then decorated as trophies. The ancient Maya of Mesoamerica were famous for their decorative use of heads. A tzampantli was a type of wooden rack or palisade that was used for the public display of human heads, typically those of war captives or other sacrificial victims. 
based on the numbers given by the conquistador André de Tapia and Fray Diego Duran, it was calculated that there were at most 60,000 skulls on the Huayi Zampantli, the great skull rack of Tenochtitlan. Although many practices from ancient Europe could certainly be called headhunting, they aren't usually referred to as such. Examples exist in the Bible, in ancient Rome and Greece, and among the Celtic and other northern European tribes. In the Bible, the future King David is known for killing Goliath, but less well known is that he beheaded the felled Goliath and displayed the head in order to verify his victory and terrify his enemies. The ancient Romans and Greeks recorded their habits of nailing the heads of their enemies to walls or dangling them from the necks of horses, and human skulls are found amongst many votive offerings in the archaeology. The Appian Way in Rome was lined with severed heads on stakes, meant to quell any thoughts of rebellion. The ceremonial display of heads was common throughout Europe in the Middle Ages as well, although it became less common toward the end of the 13th century. Despite a vast history of headhunting, most people think of the headhunting cultures in Indonesia and the Philippines. I'm going to delve into the historic reports of headhunting in those areas, mostly from the early 18th and 19th century. The majority of the information about early headhunting in this area comes from Western colonial fascination with what were deemed at the time as uncivilized people with a violent tradition. This interpretation of violent behavior legitimized to the colonists the violence with which they deemed necessary to subdue these native populations, but that is a subject for another podcast. It should be noted that most research on the practice of headhunting has been done by Western anthropologists. Because of this, the materials I was able to find for this episode are laced with cultural bias. Cultural bias is the interpretation and judgment of another culture by the standards inherent to one's own culture. Cultural bias occurs when people of one culture make assumptions about another culture's conventions, including the conventions of language, notation, proof, and evidence. These assumptions are often mistaken for the laws of logic or nature of the culture as a whole. Most of the time, this bias is unintended by the observer because one can't help but interpret new and unfamiliar things using a lens composed of familiar things. Other times, the observer leans on the differences of the other culture in order to promote their own, such as in the case of colonizers interpreting native cultures as savage or wild. Modern anthropologists have taken steps to limit cultural bias in their work, but it is close to impossible to fully understand a culture that you weren't brought up in so keep that in mind throughout this episode. I wanted to mention all this before going into detail on headhunting cultures because I feel it's important to acknowledge one's own society's biases. Knowing that flaws exist is the first step in fixing them. In presenting the information I've discovered in my research, I don't intend to generalize. Even so, if you have any issues, please email me at morbidcuriositypodcast at gmail.com. In Borneo, most of Indonesia, the Philippines, and Taiwan, early researchers observed a defined headhunting season. During that time of year, heads were hunted and sacrificed in order to improve the growth of crops. Outsiders or wayfarers were usually targeted. The most historically famous headhunting culture was the Marind Anum of New Guinea in the southwestern Pacific. In this culture, researchers reported that the human skull was believed to contain a supernatural and powerful force. Although headhunting was not motivated by hunger or ritual cannibalism, the dead person's flesh was often consumed in ceremonies following the capture and killing of the victim. In the Marind Anum culture, headhunting was linked to the name-giving of newborns. Martin de Rada reported a seasonal headhunting practice among the Ilongot in the Philippines in 1577. The Ilongot, also known as the Bugkalot, were known for their intense aggressiveness toward their Spanish colonizers and for their ability to conserve their own culture. The Kalinga people of the Philippines historically attained leadership and respect in the community through headhunting, along with other skills at which an individual excelled. Consequently, 
Neighbors and invaders alike feared them due to their reputation as headhunters. The name Kalinga means headhunter. In Sarawak, the northwestern region of the island of Borneo, James Brooke and his descendants established a colonial dynasty in the mid-1800s. Brooke first encountered the headhunting practices of the Iban during a battle in 1849. He noted that the Iban conducted sacred ritual ceremonies with special and complex incantations to invoke their god's blessings, which were associated with headhunting. These festivals were required for men of the tribe to become effective warriors. The Brook government prohibited headhunting. However, during expeditions sanctioned by the Brook government in which they enlisted the aid of the Iban, headhunting was allowed. The indigenous peoples who participated in the Brook-approved expeditions were exempted from paying an annual tax to the Brook government and sometimes given new territories in return for their service. In 1886, Italian anthropologist and explorer Elio Modigliani visited the headhunting communities west of Sumatra and wrote that the main purpose of headhunting there was to procure eternal slaves. He stated that the people believed that if a man owned another person's skull, his victim would serve him as a slave for eternity in the afterlife. Because of this, human skulls were very valuable. Sporadic headhunting continued in the area until the late 20th century, with the last reported incident occurring in 1998. The Sumba people, or Tao Humba, of Indonesia practiced headhunting in large war parties. The skulls that they collected were hung on a skull tree erected in the center of the village. The Dayak of Borneo practiced a more stratified version of headhunting. It was a chief's duty to provide heads for social occasions, like funerals for other chiefs or the erection of a new house. Headhunting took place often after planting crops, when there was a lull in farm work or after a harvest. However, there were limitations to the number of people who could participate. Not all warriors could go, or the house would be left undefended. Even small hunts had to be approved by the chief. Sometimes they set up a sort of base camp in the jungle. On larger missions, a path would be made for quick retreat. The tactic might involve setting a rival community's house on fire with wood chips and then killing those that fled from it. The point was not to exterminate the enemy, but to take a few heads, slaves, and loot. After a victory, the attackers cut off the heads of the dead or dying enemies. Then they hid their own dead in the jungle to prevent their heads from being taken and then they would retreat quickly. Throughout Oceania, headhunting tended to be obscured by cannibalism, but in many islands, the importance attached to the head was unmistakable. In parts of Micronesia, the head of the slain enemy was paraded about with dancing, which served as an excuse for raising a fee for the chief to defray public expenditure. Later, the same head would be lent to another chief for the same purpose. In Melanesia, the head was often mummified and sometimes worn as a mask in order for the wearer to acquire the soul of the dead man. In New Zealand, the Maori preserved the heads of their enemies in a form known as moko mukai. They removed the brain and eyes and smoked the head. These heads were sold to European collectors in the late 1800s, in some instances having been commissioned or made to order. Early colonial observers also reported headhunting in other parts of the world. In Africa, headhunting was known in Nigeria, where it was associated with the fertility of the crops, marriage, and with collecting servants for the afterlife. In eastern Afghanistan, headhunting was practiced until about the end of the 19th century. In the northeast of India, Assam was famous for headhunting where it was normally carried out by raiders who used surprise tactics to achieve their ends. In South America, the Shuar took the heads of their slain comrades and preserved them by removing the skull and packing the skin with hot sand, thus shrinking it to the size of the head of a small monkey, but preserving the features intact. Although non-Shuar characterized these shrunken heads, or sansas, as trophies of warfare, 
The Shuar insisted that they were not trophies. Instead, they sought the muisak, or soul of the victim, which was contained in the shrunken head. Shuar men believed that the control of the muisak would enable them to control their wives' and daughters' work, which was crucial to Shuar biological and social life. Efforts to control and suppress headhunting were made in Indonesia, the Philippines, and elsewhere in the world in the years leading up to World War II. By suppressing headhunting, colonial powers basically took away not only the indigenous people's political autonomy, but also their traditional method of securing a good crop, fertility, health, and general prosperity. Therefore, despite the prohibition of headhunting activities, scattered reports of such practices continued well into the mid-20th century. In 1968, Michel Rosaldo found that 65 of 70 adult Ilangat men over the age of 20 years had taken at least one head. This surprised her, as the people seemed to have assimilated modern Western ideas into their culture and seemed fairly peaceful. The reason they participated in headhunting was unknown, and they did not bring the heads back and display them either, as they were reported to have done in the past. Rosaldo reported that the men said that they took heads when they had a heavy heart or felt angry. In 1974, Rosaldo returned to study the reason the Ilongot took heads. She found that the Ilongot men felt that males were more passionate than females, yet had less recourse to verbal and other means of expressing that passion. They said that they felt the spirits of their victims were actually with them and helping them mature and grow to find better expressions for their emotions. They felt that they were able to attain prestige from the group and attract wives through their headhunting. Wona Keka, a Sambanese headhunter recognized by the Indonesian government as a national hero in the 20th century, was the leader of a series of raids against colonial Dutch forces. Although he did not in fact take any Dutch heads, his authority to wage war was traced to the presence of the skull tree altar in his village. His recognition made him both a representation of resistance to the Dutch colonists and any sort of resistance, be it against colonial powers or other native groups, but also a representation of the Indonesian government. In this way, the history of the hero is contested with both groups trying to claim the hero as a representative of their cause. Rumors of the government taking heads from local villages for public works projects can be found all over Southeast Asia. These heads were supposedly taken by strangers sent by the government to be buried under new roads and bridges to strengthen the structures. When a mud volcano was caused by deep oil drilling in East Java, a rumor spread like wildfire that the government was looking for hundreds of children's heads to stem the tide of mud. Anthropologists suggest that this idea of foreign or government headhunters is a reaction to the intrusive nature of the state and the loss of the community's political autonomy. The foreigners came in, took control of headhunting, and therefore became the headhunters. What once was the strength of the village was appropriated to fortify the government. These rumors of government-sponsored headhunting, however, are just that. Rumors. For the most part, headhunting has no place in the modern Western world, having been deemed excessively violent to our culture. However, it has recently occurred in situations that are already violent, such as war. During World War II and the Vietnam War, there were verified reports of U.S. soldiers occasionally collecting the heads of their enemies. These soldiers faced disciplinary actions later on. Also in World War II, shrunken heads of prisoners were found in German concentration camps. The most notable of these were at Buchenwald, where they were displayed in the center of the camp to terrify the prisoners. These situations are considered abnormal for Western culture, so I won't go into further detail now, but perhaps they'll appear in a future episode. So, what was the purpose of headhunting? What did it achieve for those that participated in it? This question has been the subject of intense discussion within the anthropological community due to the many possible social roles, functions, and motivations of headhunting. Contemporary scholars generally agree 
the primary function was ceremonial and that it was part of the process of structuring, reinforcing, and defending hierarchical relationships between communities and individuals, basically keeping together a complex, multi-leveled social structure. Themes that often arise in anthropological writings about headhunting include mortification of arrival, ritual violence, cosmological balance, the display of manhood, cannibalism, and prestige. Taking a head to steal its soul matter or turn the victim into a slave for the afterlife qualifies as mortifying arrival. Taking a head as part of a religious celebration counts as ritual violence. Taking a head so that the gods will bless your crops or prevent sickness qualifies as cosmological balance. A display of manhood would be taking a head on the day a male comes of age or to impress his potential bride. Taking heads because they are worth something, be it soul matter or material worth, is taking them to gain prestige. And of course, taking heads to eat them is a form of cannibalism. Headhunting was reported also to sometimes act as a catalyst for the end of personal and collective mourning for a community's dead. As you can see, there are many varied reasons for headhunting. During her studies in Samba, Indonesia, Janet Hoskins found that the rationale for headhunting rituals could vary even on a single small island. In East Samba, headhunting was largely part of territorial conquest, while in West Samba, it was an act of vengeance between equals. In many parts of Southeast Asia, the practice is primarily for fertility rituals. However, in most of these cases, headhunting was usually a ritual activity rather than an act of war or feuding, and involved the taking of only a single head from another village. Headhunting traditions have survived to this day in Indonesia and are undertaken by a certain group near Sulawesi. This group originally refused to give up their land and was soon surrounded by a post-colonial society. They asserted their legitimacy as a people using headhunting. They took heads, and when it was outlawed, they took effigy heads, and then head-shaped surrogates like coconuts. Then, over the years, they began to buy coconuts at the market at the time of year when their ancestors took heads. The ritual object changed, but the ritual remains to this day. This is often interpreted as a rise from savage to modern citizen, but it's truly a loss of culture due to colonialism and the suppression of a ritual that was deemed violent. Today, this harvest festival is still called by its traditional name, which means to take a head in a raid or ambush. Other modern versions of the headhunting ritual have also developed in this way. In 1996, Kenneth George wrote about annual headhunting rituals that he observed among the Mapurandu religious minority, an upland tribe in the southwest part of the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Actual heads are no longer taken. Instead, surrogate heads are used in the form of coconuts. The ritual takes place at the conclusion of the rice harvesting season. It functions as an end to communal mourning for the deceased of the past year, expresses intercultural tensions, allows men to display their manhood, distributes communal resources, and most importantly, resists outside pressure to abandon Mapurando ways of life. In the 21st century, the Shuar produce Sansa replicas. They use their traditional process on the heads of monkeys and sloths, and sell them to tourists. Headhunting was abandoned formally by the Ilgarat and Kalinga peoples at the beginning of the 20th century. The Kalinga developed an institution of peace packs called Bodang, which minimized traditional warfare and headhunting, and now serves as a mechanism for the initiation, maintenance, renewal, and reinforcement of kinship and social ties. However, headhunting shaped both the present social life and the history of both peoples so much that the many times the Ilangat gave up headhunting and then resumed it are one way by which they keep time. The Western world has been so fascinated by the heads taken by headhunters that the circulation of these heads between museums became quite popular. In the later part of the 19th century, human skulls from what were considered savage populations and remote areas of the world were desirable scientific objects for museum scholars working in the newly emerging science of anthropology, 
which at the time had the goal of constructing a universal table of the races of men. Thankfully, the field of anthropology has broadened and become far less racist in modern times, but not without continuous struggle with its original colonial and racist undertones. Repatriation of cultural material in the modern era also seeks to right, or at least acknowledge, the colonial wrongs of the past. The Maori and Shuar are attempting to reclaim the heads of their own ancestors, which are held in museums outside their home countries. Twenty heads were returned to the Maori by the French authorities in July 2012. With all of this history, how did the term headhunter become one used for business recruitment? They are more similar than you think. Modern headhunters seek experienced people to add to their own company in order to help it grow, while traditional headhunters sought the soul matter contained in human heads to add power or prestige to their own community. The first person who used the term headhunting to describe recruiting was likely using it as a joke, with both the joker and the audience knowing the normal traditional meaning of headhunting. The use of the word caught on, and eventually the traditional use was buried under the modern meaning. The term was essentially made non-violent in this way, just as the cultural ritual of headhunting has been made non-violent in the modern era. Remember, the violence of headhunting is a Western perception. The people who participated in ritual headhunting in the past did not consider it violent, but part of their way of life, a part of their culture that has become a morbid curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Your shares and ratings help us grow our creepy community. Speaking of our creepy community, the MCP is part of the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you'd like to support the MCP, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. There you'll find a donation button, links to all our social media, and other ways to contact us. Your donations help us purchase research materials like books and articles, and we really do appreciate your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>